Welcome to a brand new episode of Getting to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and today's guest is the founder of Creative Nomads, Kenesha Daughtry. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. So, yeah, um, we talked a little bit. We had the, the pre-show meeting, 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 pre-show meeting, meeting uh, before uh, <laughs> actually he said, let's record. And I wanted to... Um, I wanted to talk about just your company, your organization, and I talk about your background, your relationship with Baltimore. So for starters, could you describe your work and the mission of Creative Nomads or your your mission as a as a as a person within the industry? Sure. So I have been in the entertainment and arts industry for almost 20 years. Um, I came to Baltimore 20 years ago to go to Morgan State University and stayed because I love Baltimore. I love everything about Baltimore. Um, and so in college, I was one of the first Hidden Beach uh, interns and worked on um, promoting Joe Scott's album, Kindred the Family Soul, Jeff Bradshaw, um, Darius Rucker, a whole bunch of people. And that's how I really got into it. I love music before I actually had a, a makeshift um, promotion company called Kenichi Bar Promotions. My best friend will never let me live that down. Um, it's kind of a fire. And, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we actually worked with a couple of people during Kenichi Bar Promotions from um, Yazara to co-ed that were, that was based in Atlanta. So, you know, I got my feet a little wet and then when Hidden Beach, the opportunity um, came around because of the work that I did and the artists that I was aware of, um, they, you know, took a chance on me and a few others. And that's how that started. And so um, I've been supporting artists, advocating for artists, especially emerging artists, um, mainly soul, hip hop, but pretty much almost anyone who had talent and that aligned with, you know, my spirit or whatever their, their music or art was into. Um, and that's how I started in this work. And then with creative nomads, um, it was just evolution from what I started with gypsy soul to, um, the work I did with the Grammys and that just coming together and just having an aha moment of, what I really wanted to do, which was to advocate for artists full time, especially emerging artists, but then also connecting artists back to the community and our where art starts use program is how I do that. Um, and it's not just music, you know, all types of different arts from visual arts to um, whole wholeness and, and wellness, all types of art forms um, that we work with. But that's how we do that. And the mission of Creative Nomads is to advocate for the professional development of arts entrepreneurs and to provide access to arts, music, and cultural education and programming for youth and families. That's a wonderful mission and a wonderful backstory. And also, whoop, whoop, I'm a Morgan State bear as well. Hey, blow bears! <laughs> I was in the um, inaugural class of the Graves School of Business and Management Honors Program, so class of... Uh, oh, cool! Yeah. Um, so, and, and thank you for that. And, it, and it's really interesting that the education piece, the advocacy piece around, like, artists comes up, and that's, like, in the DNA of what you're doing and the work that you're doing. And I, I hear that that passion and that energy around it, and it's interesting because the the first episode that I did of this podcast was with uh, DJ James Nasty, and he he kind of oh. like how he's like a lot of people here, a lot of artists here. He's like they just don't have things in order. He's like I do. He's like and he's like I know people who do. <laughs> they have things organized. He's like, but a lot of people don't. He's like I want to be in that same realm of offering something that people can at least. Like, use your phone more often than just, like, sliding into someone's DMs or getting on FaceTime. Use yeah. it for the attention of your business. And um, it, it's interesting. Use it for your calendar. It's it's interesting to hear and know that <laughs> you're working in, to, in that, that space to kind of help people sort their things out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You touched on, you touched on uh, Gypsy Soul, your first, um, your first company, right? And yep. um, 
how how is share how your relationship with the arts community has changed since starting your first company to where you're currently at in your career? Um, I think the types of experiences and exchanges that I have with artists with Gypsy Soul, the entire concept was when I was in college, I had mentors. Um, I did an internship at a really um, reputable company that uh, managed the African American Festival, Jazzy Summer Nights. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot about um, hospitality management, artist management, all the stage management, all those different things. And so when I got, got out of college and my mentors stopped bringing artists to Baltimore because they would bring like Remy Shand or uh, um, Julie Dexter to Baltimore and they stopped. And so, you know, I was like, why? And they started doing parties and they said, because people weren't coming to the shows and they just, you know, weren't making money off of those endeavors. Well, for me, money has never been a motivation. Um, it's always been like the love of art. So my thought was, well, people don't want to come to the, you know, shows cause they just don't know who they are. How about we get them familiar with who they are? And that became a tagline of Gypsy Soul, get familiar. Yeah. So we would do, um, listening parties where, you know, the artists would sometimes come out and they would have questions, you know, do questions and answers about the, um, the, the album and they wouldn't necessarily perform in the beginning, not because, you know, nobody wanted them to, but it was just an economical way for people to, to find out who they were, build um, rapport with them. Cause usually if you meet an artist and you like them, you're going to buy their stuff. So even if you hear, you don't hear them uh, perform, even if you never hear that, if you experience them, and you have a conversation or just even in passing and you feel their vibe and they have a nice vibe, you're going to, to purchase their stuff. And if you don't have the money to purchase their stuff, you're going to talk them up so that other people are purchasing their stuff. Um, and that's what we were doing was trying to uh, provide platforms where they were expanding their audience um, to folks and being able to, to then, you know, sell more units and be able to then hopefully sell more tickets and then, be able to come back and perform at different places and be able to, um, to be a viability in Baltimore. Cause a lot of them were going to DC or Philly, but weren't mm -hmm. coming here. And a lot of people drive to DC to, to see a show. But of course, a lot of people weren't coming from DC up to Baltimore cause they didn't have a reason to. Um, so that experience with gypsy soul was creating experiences for, um, the artist to connect with the audience. And it would be from listening parties to actual performances after we evolved. We um, started doing something called Ear Candy, where we would have shows mainly at T-Vols, but we did have them at a couple of other places. And we would bring artists like Jesse Boykins, The Foreign Exchange, PJ Morton, a whole bunch of folks before they won Grammys or other accolades. They were coming to Baltimore and people were getting to see them first. Um, and also we were doing PR for folks too. So we would do media uh, days for like a Melanie Fiona, um, a daily, all those folks who, again, before they blew up, they were in Baltimore and a lot of people got to see them. Well, now with creative nomads, um, we still do things like the exchange, but it's more of an educational opportunity for artists. So it's more for those emerging artists who are starting to get on the road. And okay, so for exchange, you're playing with a whole bunch of artists that you probably have never met before, who have never played with each other before. So you're learning how to work with a pickup band. You have to communicate with them. You have to learn how to go with the flow. You're, you may be working with some singers that you've never worked with before. Um, or you might be a singer and you want to learn how to do background. So we're doing all this live where they're learning in a live classroom called the exchange where it looks like it's a, um, looks like it's a, a open mic, but it's not really, <laughs> um, it's more of a live classroom, but also having those, um, experiences like, uh, what else do we have? Navigation, or excavation. So navigation will have an artist who is rather successful. And when we say successful, we don't necessarily mean that, you know, they have to be an A-list celebrity. We mean that they're doing their craft and they're making their money off their craft and they're paying their bills and they're successful at doing that. We believe that just because um, you're successful doesn't mean that you have to be famous. 
Right. And so trying to also get that into people's heads too. So we will have um, peers come and talk about their journey. So we've had um, PJ Morton, we've had Pedro Moses, we've had a few people um, come and participate. And we also do something called um, excavation where artists will come and go through their entire, their new album um, and talk about songwriting, production, um, engineering, album art, collaborations, all those things that went into that. So that artists get a chance to, even though they probably made their own album, see the process of someone else who again is, is successful and you might be able to take something from their process to add to yours. So it's about now creating learning experiences because when we were doing Gypsy Soul, I knew a lot of the folks who were so talented, but I knew that they probably weren't going to go anywhere only because they didn't have the knowledge and they didn't have a team behind them. Um, and they didn't know, or the team that they had weren't very knowledgeable. And so if you don't have that knowledge of the industry, you're pretty much being set up for failure. So now it's about getting them those tools to be able to be um, successful and to thrive. And again, success doesn't mean famous. Hopefully, you know, maybe you can become famous, but it's about, you know, learning how to get those residuals. It's about learning how to do um, proper split sheets, all those different things that in the end are going to, to, to make sure that you have money and wealth, um, whether it's becoming a songwriter and not necessarily being the front performer, because mm -hmm. songwriters get paid and people mm -hmm. just don't realize that. They just want to be famous, and it's like, get your money first, then be famous. <laughs> that's, that's, that's big. Like One of the uh, guests I had actually a relatively recent like pod kind of expressed the importance of having that team around you and having people, like it's, it's just two of them, but having people that... Like, look, I know what I'm doing here. You know what you're doing here. Let's just put forth the same effort. And sometimes you don't get that. Like I had Shell and Jazz on and those are great dudes. Um, and mm -hmm. I was being a bad, bad Baltimorean when I first met them. I went during the <laughs> Ravens playoff game last year to see them do uh, Black Belt Jones. And I was like, all right, I need to hit up these guys. I feel bad. I feel like I caused that loss, all of this different stuff. And <laughs> gems were being dropped, jewels were being dropped. And that's what I'm hearing from you so far as well. So thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little My bit. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what was – maybe the question was what was the thanking, but maybe I'll shift it a little bit to – how what, what went into because it seems like it's a risk leaving from your the position you had with the Grammys to like going out on your own. Um, mm -hmm. What what was that risk? Describe that risk and describe that thinking that was there and what gave you that in, that inclination that you know what this is going to work. I got to do this. Well, it's probably going to sound really, um, I guess maybe sappy or cliche. But God, I'm, I'm a person of faith. So Gypsy Soul was definitely something that I feel like was a seed that came from God and it flourished. And I did a whole bunch of things with it, which actually um, connected me to the Grammys because of my relationships with artists and with sponsors and all those different things helped me um, to secure that position. Um, but when it was time to go, it was just like God was telling me, this is what you need to do. And I think my, my passion and my love is for emerging artists. I love, you know, those established artists too, but I feel like they have tools and emerging artists don't. Um, for me, the scope of the Grammys is, was narrow, too narrow for what I was trying to do or my desires or my dreams. Mm -hmm. And even though I did a lot of great work and they do a lot of great work with creating resources and um, opportunities for artists, um, yeah, my heart and my desire was to go back to co to connecting artists with the community first and foremost. How can we get Baltimoreans who have these crafts and talents um, inside of the schools and inside of the neighborhoods sharing that stuff with these kids who need it, but also helping to inspire them to see like maybe I am creative, maybe you know I do know how to sing or I can make music or I can draw or whatever, and you just don't have that person to be able to show you so. 
that's where that was coming from. It was, okay, we need to educate artists on a different level, um, these emerging artists, make sure they have tools and that they're getting a network um, to be able to, to do more things. Um, but also, how do we get those artists who are here and who have left, because there's plenty of successful artists from Baltimore who are on tour, who now live in L.A. or New York or Atlanta, how do we get them back even for a moment just to, to do a um, session in a, in a classroom or to talk with students who are interested in music or art or whatever? How do we connect that? And so I wanted to focus on that. Of course, you know, corporations have um, their own focus and targets. And, you know, I wanted to do something else. Ultimately, corporate isn't my thing. I like my freedom and the freedom to design platforms, how I want to do them. And um, being able to connect artists back to the community is ultimately what my heart is about. And just supporting our artists and advocating for artists in general is what I've always done um, since I was able to work inside the, the arts and entertainment industry. Good. Um, I want to talk about, I have one question. It's, it's more of a, and also, by, oh, by the way, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't think what you were saying was sappy or hokey or anything along those lines. We like sappy and hokey here because um, it's, it's, just real. it's just it's just real. And I think some of the conversations I've had on this show have been like sappy and hokey because I believe if you do something well and you're passionate about it and there's a, just an int of creativity around it, you're an artist. And I think some of the guests I've had... Mm-hmm they come to realize it and they're like, thank you for helping me realize that. And I'm like, <laughs> you're already there. I'm just, you know, I'm just in awe of what you're doing or what have you. Um, so the, the idea of a starving artist, what are your thoughts? Yeah. On that? Is that a, is that a thing? Is that something that can easily be, well, is that still a valid thing or is it a misinformed artist or underinformed artist instead of starving artists? I hope to goodness that it is an out of date thing. I cringe when I hear that. Um, my passion is definitely to build pathways for artists to not have to starve and still be able to do their art um, or not to have a nine to five and take away from their cre- creativity and still be able to do their art. So how can I build those pathways for them? How can I connect them to other peers or provide them with resources or put them in a position to be a board member or to get sponsored um, so that they don't have to have that mindset of being a starving artist? I hate that. Um, I hope that the thinking around starving artists, um, I hope it has evolved, especially now that we're in 2020 and people are starting to change their mindsets about a whole bunch of different things. I hope people are starting to think about becoming an an abundant artist. And what does that mean? Like opportunities and increase in creative ideas and increasing their network. Like that's, I want them to not be a starving artist. I want them to be a a striving one. So hopefully that mindset is gone because it's harmful to them. It's harmful to other artists. Just that whole concept of, you know, being in torture to, to have your art. No, let's change that whole thing and, and think about opportunities and abundance and striving to get to there. Absolutely. Positive affirmations and then just visualization. And you keyed in on a thing that I struggle with. And I think that people try to balance oftentimes. It's like, yeah, I got this nine to five. I'm doing this. And it's like, I think a lot of times, at least for something like this, there's a lot that goes into putting together a podcast. And some people believe it's hard. Some people believe mm-hmm. dudes with microphones or what have you, or women with microphones. And <laughs> I, I, think, I think with it, like the approach that I have, it's a lot of work that goes into it. So yep. I was, and was I able to identify early on with trying to get gather some of those tools and a lot of it coming from just organizing things and being the business student from Morgan State University and going back to that, right? Yep. Uh, I was just like, how can I offload certain things that I, I don't need to have my fingers all in? And how can I do this in a more efficient manner? Because I noticed that the craft and the enjoyment around the craft started suffering. And that's the thing that's the most crushing and the most damning. Like 
you do this to drive this. You may go to this nine to five to feed yourself, to give you the brain power and the functioning and the roof over your head to make your paintings or whatever your thing is. And then when you get time to show out and show what you know how to do, you're exhausted and you're beat. And it's like the energy somewhere. So I definitely um, see that and relate to that. And yeah, I just, I remember I read this um, book. Uh, it was called uh, Desperately Seeking Basquiat. And it was just about different places he lived and where he was at in his career at the time. And just mm-hmm. like when he was being fueled by that drug habit, it was just like the, the quality, the output was going down, the quality was going down because it mm-hmm. was this creative thing to the job. And the job was getting high, but still. Yeah. The job. And um, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, well, I think that when you start to align, when you're listening to your body, one is saying, oh, by the time I get ready to do this creative stuff, I'm exhausted. And then you start to align with the things that actually give you energy and the things that you want to do. I really believe things start to line up. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it has not been easy for, you know, quitting a nine to five job with guaranteed money to oh. start a nonprofit. <laughs> Not at all, but because this is where my soul aligns with, Mm -hmm. the things come. Um, So I think that even when it comes to artistry and and artists getting out of that starving mind frame, it's about, okay, aligning yourself with, obviously you have some type of deep connection to God or else you wouldn't be a a creative. So just trying to figure out um, what really aligns and, and getting all the other noise out of it, I think will help to, to put them on that path to, to not being starving, but again, a striving one. Clarity, clarity is key there. And, and just like, where do you get, in, where'd you get your energy from? Um, and actually, actually a question I'm, I'm going to ask you, um, but it's going to be location based. So uh-huh. this is one of the questions I asked because I want to bring the questions towards Baltimore now, because I always try to make that connection. And you've definitely been making it uh-huh. because you're invested in the folks here and you have ties here. So one of the places that I get a lot of energy from, I think it's location based and that would be, um, station North. I get a lot of energy from station. North. Oh. I go there. I just get hit like uh, Charles village. It's just like, I'm seeing different things. Mount Vernon, that whole kind of strip. Sometimes I just like walk through there aimlessly, grab a cup of coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm able to kind of think and I'll see like architecture and just different people. And I don't know. It's just like an energy and an aura there. Is is there an area in Baltimore where you kind of elicit and just get some creativity or you just feel like those juices are flowing? Wowzers. Um, one, <laughs> I, I, I might get in trouble because I know that, you know, Baltimore is like West Side, East, East Side, side <laughs> Downhill, all that. So somebody would be like, oh, for real? But I have always loved the West Side. I don't know what it is, but something about the West Side just does it for me. It doesn't matter, like, if it's, you know, North Avenue, um, if it's Reisterstown Road or whatever. It, something about just crossing over that line and being on the West Side just just um, perks me up. <laughs> but I will say that the parks, um, especially Druid Hill, mm-hmm. I don't know why, but I just feel free and creative there. Um, yeah, so that's that's definitely one space that that does it for me. The outside Druid Hill, but West Side Baltimore, something about that area, Reservoir Hill, yeah. Bolton Hill, um, Penn North, Pennsylvania Avenue, like all oh, all that stuff. Just yeah. You keep, That's me right. keep naming locations. I'm going to turn it into a club song somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, club West Side. It, it, but it, yeah, it's, it's a thing where I think, because like West, when I think of West Baltimore, I just think of just like black art and black prosperity that kind of got nullified. Oh, hmm. People tried to build things over it and these kind of failing businesses. And I think that that's something mm-hmm. that can come back very soon, very quickly and very strong. Um, but that's exactly what I think of and when I think of West Baltimore, and I just think of the different zones in and around Baltimore. There's a lot of areas where talent and where art and all of this stuff is there. You can see it because it's uh, Baltimore is a um, it's a city of neighborhoods or what have you. So it's each everything is. It is. 
And I think you get hit with, I don't know if it's spirit or energy or whatever, but you get hit with a different energy and it relates back to the art and the talent that I think is there. Um, so, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so DMV, <laughs> um, what would you say makes the DMV, specifically Baltimore, their art scene so unique? So, first of all, I think that a lot of people would say that Baltimore isn't even in the DMV. Mm. <laughs> so, there's that whole thing right there. So you um, the question about which, you pass that one. <laughs> oh, for real. Oh, all yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, I think that might be one of the first things that make Baltimore so new, unique in the area that we're in. It's just that Baltimore is so different from any other thing out here. But I think one of the most beautiful parts of Baltimore, which probably made me want to stay uh, even more so, is community. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's definitely a lot of silos and a lot of clicks like that. That is a thing, but I think because Baltimore is so small, you're bound to know someone who knows someone like you're probably instead of like five um, people away from someone, you're probably one or two. Um, <laughs> and because of that, there's just, just this tight knit community of creatives that, that are here. And like I said, even if you don't have a relationship with a particular person, you know, somebody who knows that person or probably has worked with that person. And so even though you don't know them because that person you do know has worked with them, you're rooting for them because you're rooting for your friend. Um, so that's one thing, but also I feel like there's such a deeper consciousness here Mm -hmm. than a lot of other places too. Um, and I felt that since I was at Morgan State University, you know, on campus when we had GQ and TTC and a whole bunch of, um, consciousness and, and up and up, which were actually um, guys from PG, but you know, the, the energy was here in Baltimore. We would have ciphers, all those different things, but that consciousness, that consciousness of blackness in Baltimore, which is pretty evident in how Baltimore has gave off a lot of gentrification um, as opposed to a lot of other cities. Um, probably is another unique aspect of the creative scene here is that there's some really, um, what is a good word? Community focused, bout it people in Baltimore who love their city, love the people, um, and, and it's going to let you know about it and it's not going to take no stuff. <laughs> so I think the militancy of Baltimore, the the black love and consciousness about Baltimore, and then also the community, the really, really deep community aspect of Baltimore, the village aspect of Baltimore uh, sets us apart from a lot of different folks. I, I always describe Baltimore as possessing uh, gritty authenticity. Absolutely. So, um, got a few more questions and then just an opportunity for you to shamelessly plug your stuff, uh, creative nomads, you, I mean, you might have a mixtape drop and I don't know, but anything that you want, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a few minutes towards the end to, to plug that stuff. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, I am, I imagine that designing experimental events takes a fair amount of uh, patience and imagination. In what ways has your approach changed during the, the current normal or during COVID or what have you? Um, I'm a person that goes with the flow. So when COVID started happening, it didn't, it didn't really stop what we were doing. Uh, we actually had a lot of programs that went forward that were supposed to be one way and win another. Um, but I think that the use of technology definitely helped to make sure that we kept going throughout the summer, throughout the spring. Um, um, and even now as we plan for the future is that it's definitely just been the, the technology that has helped, but also just being able to to go with the flow, not necessarily being fearful or scared of what was going on or how it was going to affect us. Um, so I think being cre- creative in general and always designing things that 
who are always out the box anyway, mm-hmm. having to think outside the box now that COVID is here is just a natural thing. That makes sense. Makes sense. It's like if you, if, if your business is, uh, your organization, or whatever you're doing is sorted in a way that you can have that moment of adjustment to be able to shift. You, you can see how certain places that are having the issues, they're, they're not set up to pivot in other places. Just like, eh, well, we all had to adjust, but I think we're all right. And, and it's good to hear that. Right. Yeah, we're doing great. We're thriving. And thank God for that. That's good to hear. Um, so let's see. Uh, could you mention any people or agencies that you think are doing it right? That they're just like knocking it apart. People that or organizations that you admire. Just uh, share a few of those. Sure. So I think um, TT the artist who is a freaking Baltimore club <laughs> goddess um, is doing a, a awesome job with extending the culture out to Hollywood. She's worked with Issa Rae. She's had some, some music on some of the, I think, Insecure um, episodes as well as some other things. And she definitely just did a film that was supposed to premiere this year, I believe at South by Southwest, but because of COVID wasn't able to. And so they did, um, another premiere here, but she is definitely doing some awesome stuff, just representing Baltimore and pushing the the club culture um, throughout the country, which is definitely needed because there are some places that bite off of Baltimore and don't give us credit, but um, she's helping to to make sure that that we get the credit over here. Um, I think also Ultra Nate, she, I think people are asleep on her. If you're not really in the club scene, you don't, and you don't know who she is. She has been doing um, doing something called oh my gosh, sugar, sugar. Oh. It's something sugar, um, and I can't even think of it. I'm going blank. But she's amazing, and she's a resource that has been here. She's internationally known. Um, she's been making music for years, and she just is a phenomenal woman who gives back her time um, to to many people and many causes. But she's an awesome artist who definitely is from here and um, lives here and and uh, people around the world, especially in the dance and EDM culture. Um, know who she is. Um, Deep Sugar, that's what it is. Deep Sugar, yes. Yeah, deep. Um, oh. yeah. But then also, this this is long gone, <laughs> but I still want to mention it because it's definitely a staple in regards to the entertainment and art scene in Baltimore, especially if you're around, um, you know, around 2000. Organic Soul. Organic Soul set up so many artists from Baltimore, brought so many artists in from across the country um, to Baltimore and created connections and networks throughout the country. It was like part of a Chitlin circuit, like a New Day Chitlin circuit. Organic Soul, all the folks who worked on it um, and made it what it was. Yeah, I admire what they were doing, how they did it, and just their ability to be able to um, promote artists who are still around today in Baltimore, um, as well as artists who are from other places in the country who still admire or have a connection to Baltimore because of, of organic soul. Oh yeah. I dig it. Uh, so that brings me to my last question. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's, it's the, the toughest rough. I always act like people are on the hot seat, but they're really not. Um, <laughs> so could you share a piece of advice that you received maybe early on in your career, maybe even going back to, you know, those days of being in those days in the cave. I need to get that over. I want to get Morgan stayed over as the cave because you know, bears, but can you give us a piece of advice that you maybe received when you were younger that still remains true and that you still kind of look back at and elicit um, maybe motivation or energy from today? Absolutely. So there's two things, actually. The first one is, relationships are more important than money. And then the second one is treat people how you want to be treated, which is freaking the most simplest thing ever. But with the relationships part, money again has really never been my motivation. Um, 
And because of that, because I definitely was not making like bank with Gypsy Soul, but what I did do was create a whole lot of relationships with a whole lot of artists that then I was able to pull from and have that um, social currency when I went to the Recording Academy um, and, and with Creative Nomads. So having those relationships has advanced the things that I've wanted to do has created opportunities for me um, in lieu of money. I've traveled to Cuba yeah. for free because of a relationship with someone, um, a professional relationship with someone where I was able to do some work, but also just be able to explore this beautiful country um, because of that relationship. Like I didn't have to put out any money. So you, I didn't need money for that. So I just feel like people value, um, monetary things over over relationships or over experiences and money always fades but relationships if you you know tend to them right you nurture them right they can be around forever and they can help you to get what you need that sometimes money can't buy um and to treat people how you want to be treated uh i remember someone told me um, when you go inside of the club, everybody should know you work for the grammys and that just really like blew my mind I was like okay. for what And their whole like premise was so that they can treat you differently. And my thing was, if you didn't treat me well and you didn't know that I worked for the Grammys, then why would I want you to treat me well when you figure out that I do? I want to be able to have a genuine interaction with you and you have one with me. And I want to know what your character is Um, outside of titles or, uh, you know, um, status, all those different things. I'm, I'm certainly not about that. I love to make sure that people are treated well. And so treat people how you want to be treated. Of course, you know, somebody continually treats you badly. It, it, it may not apply, but <laughs> you know, especially first off, just treat people how you want to be treated, regardless of what you think their status is or who they are or whatever. Cause it's usually the people behind the scenes that are actually have the power that you don't know who they are. Absolutely. Um, you know, you go in there, like, even for like something as simple as like going to an interview or something. And I've read and I've heard in different like circles that if you go there to an interview and you kind of treat the, uh, maybe the receptionist, or the first person you see, the door person, even someone like yep. that, that, oh, that gets back to whoever's interviewing you. Like you're a jerk, yep. you know, and it's just, you know, like what you're saying there is very valid and very like, it's it's simple in that you shouldn't forget it. Like you described the golden rule, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. And mm-hmm. I agree with that notion. I agree with that and both of them, but I agree with also that notion of just, you know, just do just do things the right way or what have you. It's not about money. It's not the it's, right it's way. Relationships. It's always about relationships um, and experiences and, and things of the sort. Um and going back to one of the things you touched on earlier, I think that connects to it, you know, there have been times where it's just like, how am I going to do this? I need to do this to get that. And somehow it just falls into place. Like somebody made yep. a relationship will remember, hey, this was a great interview or, hey, I like this. You know what? Yeah. You should do this. Here's my number. Here's this person. They, yep. They'll know you. Everything is great. It's based off of relationships. And as a person that my background and what I focused on at Morgan really at the time and up until maybe the last few years, it was never really about relationships. It was about, you know, how can I get this done on my own and recognizing as you, you know, Mm -hmm. build out a team, you got to do these things with other people. And it's not that I was averse to relationships. It's just, I didn't have the skills for it. I think a lot of people kind of relate to it. It's just like, eh, I don't do that. But it's like you can. And I think that's one of the lost things, especially being a HBCU grad that we don't necessarily grasp all the time is that those people that you're going to school with, that's your network, whether they're in, you know, the architecture department or the business department or the um, communications department, like those people, when you get older, those, those are the people that you tap into. Um, that's what you, you're supposed to be building and doing and having. And I don't think there's enough relationship building skills or, um, programs that, that are provided to be able to make sure that, that young folks are taking advantage of that and understand the value of relationships, but also how to build them. 
that's that's important you're absolutely right that it gets missed and you know even now i still have some but but no you're right you know that's exactly what it is and i i'm i know for myself i'm trying to make a better effort in doing that and just i find that you know you look at the past and you're like eh, i shouldn't do it that way and then now i'm mm-hmm. just like i'm just gonna shoot emails out there people respond cool what did they call that's me? right two seconds to send this email and, you know, ended up getting a great conversation such as the one that I'm wrapping up with you uh, right now. Hey. <laughs> so um, feel free <laughs> to shamelessly plug anything that you have coming up, your website, your socials, all of that stuff. And we'll close out from there. Awesome. So we actually have a community um, project, well, a community fun day happening October 17th. I'm not sure when this uh, podcast is coming out, but October 17th, we're having Art in the Park, spooky fun um, for families. And so, you know, they can register by going to our IG. The handle is creative underscore nomads. Um, And the registration link is in our bio in the link tree, but also they can visit us at the creative nomads.org on our website. Um, and that's how they can get in touch with us if they have any questions, but we plan to have, we, we caroled last year in the hood, which was such an awesome experience. Um, because a lot of times, you know, black neighborhoods don't get caroling and so they don't get that experience. And we did that last year, this year, we may do something a little bit different because of COVID, but we're definitely going to have some carols in the hood. So please follow us to be able to figure out when that's going to happen and to join us because it's going to be freaking awesome singing holiday songs around the hood. I like this. I like this idea. I may come out and work on the baritone and, and put that out there. I don't... Come on. I can't sing worth nothing and I'll be out there belting. I got to so... grow my beard back. Like I shaved all of my facial hair off so I need to grow it back so I can have like, you know, the six foot four chubby Santa Claus thing going on. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get you a hat. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so that's it. Um, I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast. And thank you for having me. Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up uh, for uh, Kanisha Daltrey um, of Creative Nomads. I'm Rob Lee um, saying there's art in and around Baltimore. You just have to look for it.